watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday evening, joined by Eric Ibarra and William Albrecht, and also special guest, E. Christian Brugger, Dr. Brugger. He has written an excellent book that I highly recommend. You can find it there in the description. The title is The Indissolubility of Marriage and the Council of Trent. And, you know, this has been a topic I've spoken about uh, on occasion here and there. And uh, every time I do, everybody says, well, you know, get get Dr. Brugger's book. Make sure to read that. Check it out. And there, everybody's always referencing it. So I thought, you know what? I need to check this book out. And in fact, I did. And I thought, well, you know what? He would be an excellent guest to have on and here he is welcome to the show dr brugger thank you to have you on yes thank you happy to be here you know like i said your book has been a fascinating read it is again on the topic of the indissolubility of marriage at the council of trent let's maybe first start with just the basics before we dive into the nitty gritty what exactly is the catholic teaching of indissolubility as it's uh, expressed at the council of trent um, the Council of Trent was called primarily to deal with the errors of the reformers, um, the two great reformers, primarily uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin. Um, and among their errors were denials that marriage rightly entered into and consummated was unbreakable. They denied that. In the backdrop was the Eastern Orthodox churches that had been denying the indissolubility of marriage going back to about the ninth century. Mm. So the Council Fathers, when treating the issue of marriage, had a delicate balance. One is they were directly going after the reformers, but because they had in the background this long-standing issue of disunity with the Greeks, they um, needed to formulate their teaching in a way that addressed both mm. while taking into consideration certain pastoral questions. Mm. And what was the teaching? The teaching was that uh, um, rightly ratified, consummated Christian marriage is absolutely indissoluble. Mm. So not only should it not be the bond of marriage not be broken, but it cannot be broken. Once it's brought into existence, it cannot be broken until the death of one of the spouses, which precludes remarriage by either of the spouses while the separated spouse still lives. Even in the case of adultery? Even in the case of adultery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, the adultery question is one that bedevils the history of this question, both on the Greek side and on the reformer side. Mm. And, and especially because, you know, there there is that um, part in scripture where it seems to indicate that there is um, divorce that's permitted in that, ca- in that case. How did the council fathers maybe respond to that part of the, uh, of scripture? Well, for the sake of those who are, who are watching, you're, you're discussing the teaching in in St. Matthew's gospel where he says, um, if if any man divorces his wife, um, except uh, fornicationes, Mm -hmm. except for adultery, um, and marries another, he commits adultery, or she commits adultery, and the man who does it also commits adultery. So Mm -hmm. these these two words, except uh, fornicationes, were needed to be interpreted. And so you go back to the fathers of the church and all of them um, who speak about marriage are giving interpretation to what those words mean. And so there's some question in the historical debate, did any of the fathers interpret them straight up to mean it's only indissoluble if adultery is not at play? But if there's mm. adultery at play, then the marriage bond can dissolve. That's mm. a question that the fathers ask, not the fathers of Trent. I mean, the, the fathers of the church. Mm. And so um, Trent was aware 
that the question um, had not been definitively settled in the writings of the church fathers. Mm -hmm. Now, you had spoken of, well, they, they wanted to kind of guard against certain formulations, at least because they had some pastoral concerns that what they were considering. In reference to those pastoral concerns, I, I, I presume one of them is this, and this is something that we see uh, from the uh, description of your book from CUA. It says in the description for your book, quote, Brugger proposes that Trent did indeed dogmatically teach the absolute indissolubility of sacramental marriage, while conceding a policy of toleration but not approval for greek divorce for the sake of ecclesial communion between the churches in quote i imagine this is one of the pastoral concerns that you are referencing there so um my first question is is that one of them and if so um how is it possible that the church could formulate something uh that excludes divorce and remarriage and yet still tolerate it in practice well, this is this presumes a lot of um, a lot of conversation, Michael. Um, mm. If I may, if I may, um, the final months of Trent in the 15, 1563 is when its final teaching on marriage was being um, crystallized. Remember, Trent began in in fifteen forty fifteen forty five. So there have been years and years of conversation on marriage, but they're now crystallizing. What do we want to teach? And right up until August 7th, the council is teaching anyone who says that marriage can be dissolved in cases of adultery, let him be anathema. Right up until August 7th, that's going on. The vast majority of fathers underwrite that and approve it and say that we, we, we're happy with that formulation. On August 11th, a delegation of bishops and prelates from the Republic of Venice, Venice was not just a city at the time, but it was actually um, a province and it, 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 it had its own princedom and principality and, and um, multiple territories. And this delegation said, look, in certain ones of our region, especially on the islands of the Mediterranean, we have Greek Christians and Catholics living together in a kind of careful balance. Mm. They acknowledge the leadership of the Catholic bishops, and once a year they pay tribute to the Pope, mm -hmm. and we allow them to continue their ancient ritus mm -hmm. or rite, which means dismissing a wife in cases of adultery. And that delegation says, if you go ahead and publish the canon, you go ahead and publish the condemnation as proposed on August 7th, you're going to have a pastoral catastrophe on these islands because they're going to see you condemning them. And in that con condemnation, this balance, this, this fragile kind of partial unity will be completely broken. So the delegation says, would you please reformulate the canon indirectly? So rather than saying, if anyone says that marriage is dissoluble in cases of adultery, say this, if anyone says the church errs, is wrong when she teaches that marriage is indissoluble in cases of adultery, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds sort of like the same thing, just in a, in a circuitous route. Obviously, if, you say, if, if anyone denies that the church teaches truthfully when she teaches absolute indissolubility, that implies that the church teaches truth when she teaches absolute indissolubility. And yet, it does say, um, if anyone says the church errs. Now, the Protestants were saying that. The Catholic mm. Church is wrong. It says absolute indissolubility, and we have all these grounds for adultery. The Greeks weren't saying that. They were going on with, with their ancient right of divorce, but they weren't challenging the Catholics. So, the, so Trent was able to define absolute indissolubility 
while condemning the Protestants mm -hmm. and just indirectly condemning what's believed by the Greeks, but not putting a direct anathema upon them. And you ask, how can there be partial unity? Well, that's what in fact was going on in the Republic of Venice. There was a partial unity. The Catholics were not saying what you believe is true for you. <laughs> the Catholics weren't saying we are in full communion. Absolutely not. You would have to reject your stance on divorce and remarriage. But the Catholics were saying we're willing to be in partial unity with you. Um, presuming that you accept the Catholic teaching or, or at least you don't oppose it publicly. Mm -hmm. And hopefully over time we can move towards full communion where you would accept Catholic doctrine. Why wouldn't they still feel condemned by the way it's it was reformulated? If, if they're saying, well, the church doesn't err whenever it teaches this, then they're still going to feel condemned, you would think. Well, that, that's a good question, Michael. And we don't really have records of what the Greek community felt at the time. Mm. They did, however, see Trent make an effort mm. not to put them under the direct umbrella of the anathema. Wow. Now, they knew what the Catholic Church te taught very well. Mm. And the fact that the church was teaching it still, they, were, they, they expected that. Yeah. But in, in the church moving the... The wording to indirectly, I think, I, I don't think the unity in the Venetian provinces was thrown into disorder because of this. I think that it actually, for a time, continued under this kind of partial broken unity. So what that seems to say to me is that the uh, Greeks in the Venetian pro provinces um, were you know, we're satisfied with the Catholics teaching what they taught, as long as it wasn't saying to them they're condemned now. You know, it was the uh, theologian Piet Franzen who um, made a big deal about the changing of the words there in the canon. And he wants to say, well, because there's this changing there, you know, if if anyone says that the count that the church errs when it says he wants to say, well, because that changed, it's actually excluding the Greek practice. Why do you think that that is an unreasonable interpretation? What is there going on at Trent that would say, nope, they still intend to indirectly uh, exclude even the Greek practice? <clears throat> well, you're, you're bringing up the most important theological question of the last hundred years mm. and of the last several years as <laughs> marriage and, and divorce and remarriage has come back to the surface. Yeah. And the question was, did Trent intend to define the absolute indissolubility of marriage or did it mean to give a slight open door in cases of adultery? Now, since about a decade after the ending of Trent, you have interpreters looking at Canon 7 and saying, look, that indirect formulation means something. I think it means the council did not intend to define marriage as absolutely indissoluble. We think, and there's, I say we because there are a number of them. Paul Sarpy is the first right then in, in about the 1570s and then the 1600s and the 1700s, right up until post-Vatican II progressive theologians. And there's a kind of progressive reading of Trent on indissolubility. Mm -hmm. And this question was raised for me because several years ago, a very influential article was published in the most prestigious theological journal called Theological Studies um, by Kenneth Himes and Michael Corridan, arguing precisely what I've just said. Trent didn't mean to divine absolute indissolubility. If Trent didn't define it, it's not a dogma. It's an eminent small t tradition, but it's not a dogma. But since we've got all kinds of pastoral problems today that seem to warrant divorce and remarriage, why don't we change the teaching? And, and there was, it was a, a very tight, tightly written article, and it was a very long article. And at the heart of it was Piet 
Franzen's interpretation of the documents of Trent. Mm -hmm. And when I started to read into the commentators of the last 50 years, I found that um, all the major commentators who argue with Franzen that marriage is not absolutely indissoluble, they all are just following his scholarship. None of them has done any independent scholarship. So I decided to read very carefully all of Franzen's work and then to see whether, in, and then to read the, the documents of Trent, especially the preliminary discussions. Because the first thing you look at when you, when you are interpreting what a council teaches is you look at the plain face wording of the text. And very often that will settle the question. But if the plain face wording doesn't, in fact, make lucid the intentions of the author, one of the best ways of getting at their intention is to go back and look at the preliminary discussions, which are carefully, carefully collated in, in church documents and see what were they saying about this issue such that it can help, it could be as a kind of, interpretive lens for something in the in the actual promulgated text that's ambiguous. It can help you interpret it more clearly. Mm -hmm. Now, Franzen said, look, this is ambiguous, Canon 7, and it was ambiguous. I admit that. And, canon go, and, and Franzen goes on to say, this ambiguity means the council wanted to allow the practices of the Greeks. In other words, allow divorce and remarriage. The closer I looked at his reading, the more I saw that he was just helping himself to conclusions and reading the texts very um, selectively. So when I went back to 1543 and read everything that was said on marriage, it was overwhelmingly clear to me, Michael, that the council fathers who wrote the final formulation of Canon 7, the, the majority of the Council Fathers were utterly convinced that a consummated Christian marriage, that is, a, that is a sacramental marriage, can be dissolved by nothing but death. So it's implausible to say that this move from a direct to an indirect formulation meant that they were going to throw out 1,500 years of really clear teaching that marriage is absolutely indissoluble at the petition of the Venetian delegation. That really is almost preposterous. And yet, if you don't have an argument against it, it's and someone intelligent like France and argues for it, it's going to look like, well, maybe that's what really was going on. Even the young Ratzinger in the 1950s, Ratzinger read Franzen and said, um, yeah, it looks like Trent did not intend to define absolute indissolubility. When he was prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, he rejected his original interpretation and he came and said, no, Trent did intend to define indissolubility. So the reason I have confidence that this, this indirect formulation means in fact to pass on what Ambrose and Augustine and Florence and the whole tradition had passed on is because I looked into the minds of the fathers at Trent in the week before the Venetian delegation stood up and said, what did they believe? And then I said, the Venetian delegation wasn't changing their fundamental belief. It was just changing the way that belief is being formulated for the sake of the pastoral, um, you know, pastoral nuance for the v Venetians. I'm going to pass it to William here in just one second. I have just one quick follow-up question to what you just said there at the last part. Um, you mentioned Florence and Ambrose. Was it the case that some thought that if they did strongly and forcefully condemn in the end, I'm sorry, affirm the indissolubility of marriage, that they thought that that might condemn Ambrose? And then the second part is, um, did Florence also take a policy where it tolerated divorce and remarriage among the Greeks? Okay. Um, there's an author that 
is now a father that's now called Ambrosiaster. He's sometimes referred to as Pseudo Ambrose. Mm -hmm. And Pseudo Ambrose in the fourth century did read the acceptive clause mm -hmm. as allowing divorce and remarriage because of understanding adultery to dissolve the union. Now, the fathers of Trent hadn't yet come to realize that Pseudo Ambrose was Pseudo. And they thought that among the many statements where Ambrose defends indissolubility, that this statement from Pseudo Ambrose was actually the great father mm -hmm. who, who converted St. Augustine. And you, you asked, were some of them anxious if they went forward to condemn um, dissolubility in the case of, case of adultery, would they be in somehow implying that Ambrose was wrong? Yes, there was a small handful of fathers who expressed a concern that if we go ahead and condemn um, this proposition directly, we're mm -hmm. gonna be condemning Ambrose. But it's, it's a very small number of fathers. And again, the vast majority of the fathers um, said either Ambrose, we, we should go with these other texts of Ambrose in which he affirms absolute indissolubility and mm -hmm. not pay attention to this, these other texts, or they say, Ambrose doesn't settle it, we're, we're, we're gonna settle it. So um, Franzen makes a big deal of this, of this point that the fathers weren't willing to condemn um, uh, dissolubility in cases of adultery because it would have indirectly applied to Ambrose. But it's just not true that it was a major issue among the fathers. It was a very minor issue. And the 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 second part was the Council of Florence did it also um, tolerate, you know, the, this right among the Greeks. It was aware of the right. Um, towards the end of the council, there was a short reunion between East and West, facilitated by the Pope who was overseeing the council, um, and. At the end of the documents in which that unity was effected, the Pope said, and you guys got to go clean up your practice of divorce and remarriage. It was a kind of, it was not part of the, of Florence's authoritative text, but mm -hmm. it was a pastoral injunction given to the bishops of, um, of the East in order for this to be effected. It, it was only effected for a short time and then, disunity arose again, but it showed that, it showed the church struggling with the question, how do we deal with the fact that true churches, apostolic churches, differ on a fundamental dogma, a teaching of divine revelation, and there at times has been more and less patience with the, um, the position of, of Orthodox Christians. And when the Pope tells him, look, you got to clean this up, do you think that maybe he wasn't necessarily saying, well, you can't permit this in the case of adultery, but maybe could he have been referring to the fact that they were adding all these other 16 other exceptions in addition to adultery that allowed for divorce and remarriage? Is that maybe possible that what he was referring to? Or was it explicit he was referring to adultery as well? It's, it's not clear to what he was referring. As I said, it was not promulgated in the, in the, in the you know, definitive assertions of the council. It was, there were pastoral words given to the bishops and prelates of the East. So presumably he was saying, look, we know you're doing this. Let's, tr let's try to get as much on the same page as possible right. so, that we, so that this unity can continue. Because if you, if you, don't, if you continue to flagrantly divorce and remarry, it's going to make it very difficult for us to remain in unity. But I don't know of all that um, may have been implied in the statement. William, I'm sorry to haul Dr. Brugger here. Let me pass it on to you. No, that's been great. I've been really, uh, really following the conversation. It's been great. Uh, you both have been fantastic. Dr. Brugger, I'm, uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure really listening to the discussion and it really does it opens up the 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 conversation in my opinion to go 
in, towards the direction of, uh, I heard a little bit of Ambro about Ambrosiaster. Is there any evidence for divorce and remarriage in the first few centuries of the church? Can we find any evidence of this? And the reason I ask you this is, you know, very well, uh, it seems like uh, divorce and remarriage is, is something that is very common within Protestantism. And it, in my opinion, a very unfortunate thing that we find it, it becoming more and more acceptable within uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, almost to the point where you have individuals um, attempting to really say, okay, well, this was not so clear cut and was more common than maybe we, we, we thought originally in the early church fathers. So that's why I ask you, is, is there any, any evidence that leans you know, any particular way in the early church, maybe in the first uh, 400 years or five centuries, if you will? Well, we, ha we have to think, think about those centuries. Um, the Christian community was like leaven within the, the bread of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of peoples in the first centuries were not yet Christians. Sure. And yet, after the conversion of Constantine in 325, you now have a Christian emperor and he starts Christianizing the laws. Well, you're gonna have really deep-seated, deep-rooted practices, both within historic Judaism and within the Roman tradition of, um, of sending away the spouse, which, which effectively meant the dissolution of the bond. Sure. Uh, so when the fathers are writing on this, they're looking around them and they're seeing lots of Christians divorcing and remarrying and the overwhelming pastoral solution is never to assert, other than Ambrosiaster in one verse, never to assert that divorce and remarriage are licit. However, there are texts that are ambiguous as to whether or not a kind of separation can happen. The word um, divorce is used. There's no text of any of the fathers, neither Basil, neither Chrysostom, certainly not um, Augustine, where in looking at the acceptive clause, there is a positive assertion, one who divorces his wife may remarry while she still lives. Mm -hmm. So whenever, so there are, if you look in Orthodox, Greek Orthodox literature on this question, they will bring up a number of texts in the fathers where the word, the, the commonly translated word for divorce is used. And they say, see here, this father like Basil is affirming what we now hold to be true. And that is in cases of adultery and in parallel cases. But I, I have in my book, I, I, I go through all of these passages and I show how, yes, certain of the wording doesn't settle it really clearly, probably because it wasn't, William, it, it wasn't certain in their own minds. They're looking at the Roman world. They see yeah. the acceptive clause. The Holy Spirit is unfolding the teaching within the, in the Catholic community. And so their texts at times read ambiguous. So what we have to ask is, do we ever see the church either in her greatest theologians or in any of her councils um, or synods asserting that, that remarriage after divorce is listed? And the answer is no, we do not. We see a gradual shift happening in the East after East and West get split. And that's quite interesting how that happens. But in the Western Roman church, there is no place where divorce and remarriage is ever said to be licit. That That is a really, really fantastic point that you make there. So just for the audience to be aware, you actually go through these examples of these contested texts, if you will, in your book then. I do, yeah. Magnificent. You, you brought up, and I find it very, you know, very thought compelling. You bring up Ambrosiaster. I wonder, and I, I wonder because I'm pretty sure I know the answer. You've probably looked at uh, St. Ambrose himself to where he doesn't allow for divorce and remarriage. Uh, particularly, I, I don't remember his commentary in one of the gospels, but I've, I've looked into that on Ambrose. So was there any, perhaps any confusion, I guess, 
uh, with certain people believing this to be Ambrose, uh, where we have certain types of Ambrose not allowing divorce or remarriage. And then you've got Ambrose Yaster, which seems to be writing in a similar fashion, but, um, but saying something different. Are you aware of any, maybe any confusion on that? I'm sure you have read the actual Ambrose on the, on the matter. Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, like I said to Michael, the issue was brought up at Trend because it wasn't until after the 1560s that we came to see that Ambrosi Astor was not Ambrose. So yeah. Ambrosi Astor's sort of straightforward affirmation that marriage, that Christian marriage can dissolve in cases of adultery was taken to be the words of Great, the great St. Ambrose of Milan. The question, and yes, so there was, there was confusion about that. Some fathers, yeah. some fathers denied it. They said, look, Ambrose says all these other things in his commentaries. These are inconsistent with this one, this one verse. So we're just, we're just not going to let this one verse um, change the overall framework of interpretation. But most of the fathers thought that Ambrose was saying both and. Okay. And yeah. Some, some were bothered enough to say, if we're flirting with condemning Ambrose, then we're going too far. But that was a, that was a, a minority. There might have been three or four of the 192 fathers who were willing to say, don't define absolute indissolubility because it'll it'll include Ambrose in there. Yeah. Um, the others just said, well, Ambrose was wrong. If in fact he said that, and they often were, um, they held in abeyance their final judgment, they said he was he was wrong and we're, we ought to go forward anyway and teach, teach this. Yeah, that's fantastic. One other thing that I've heard brought up a number of times, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, when we're looking at, and I, I, it fails my memory, my memory's failing me, is it Matthew chapter 19 or, or somewhere around there where there where we were talking about the exception clause? I don't remember where. I know it's in Matthew, though, in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Now, one comment that I've heard brought up a number of times, and we hear this objection from, uh, from our Eastern Orthodox friends where they will say, well, the council fathers were very ignorant of the actual Greek of the Gospel. They're examining the Latin, not actually aware of what the Greek says. Now, from what I have looked at, there were some really mega scholars that we had there at Trent that would have been uh, very well versed, not only in the Latin and the Greek. And I would say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the Latin fairly is representative very well of the Greek of the text. Um, so their analysis of it and their, uh, their treatment of it would have been a fair treatment. Is that a correct uh, conclusion? Oh, absolutely. The finest, the finest classical scholars in the in the world were at the Council of Trent. Um, they knew that the Greek term porneia was yeah. um, uh, translated into for fornicationes, which sounds like fornication to us, but the Council Fathers translated it always as adultery. And porneia has been a difficult a difficult term to define. What is porneia? And you'll see in like the, the New American text that's used on Sundays at, at local parishes, it'll say, except for unlawful marriage. In other words, marriages that are invalid, they haven't come into existence, they're annulled, they're annullable. Yeah. That's what, uh, that, that was Augustine's argument that except the fornicationes meant a kind of species of marriage that wasn't a real marriage. But the Greeks, it's, it's an interesting conversation with our, our Eastern brothers, brothers and sisters because they really don't start from a principled position of defending divorce and remarriage because the universal church, including the East, defended absolute indissolubility sure. for centuries. What happens is as East and West get separated more and more and the emperors like Justinian and his successors in the East begin to exercise more and more influence over the churches because the East didn't have a Pope. So what, who was their Pope? The emperor was the Caesaropapus, as you've heard the term. Sure. Caesar was the Pope. 
So what happens is Roman law, which permitted divorce and remarriage in many instances, seeps its way like 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 through a window where the where the molding is starting to break down, seeps its way into Eastern canon law. And there's never like a place where where a flag is planted by the Orthodox saying, we believe that the acceptive clause ought to be read this way. It's actually by about the ninth century, the interpenetration of civil Roman law and Eastern canon law comes together to such an extent that you have positive assertions of so-called justifying reasons for adultery, I mean, for divorce and remarriage. And then in retrospect, you have Greek theologians arguing, well, the acceptive clause is where we find it grounded in scripture. But that's, that's a thousand years in retrospect, they say that. That's not very what, late. That's not what's set, being said in the sixth or seventh or eighth or ninth or even in the 10th century. Wow, so so relatively uh, very late. That's that's pretty late. Um, and when we finally see that occurring, does it become um, almost commonplace, or is it a gradual kind of um, disintegration, if you will? Well, as I said, because Roman civil law allowed divorce and remarriage for multiple causes, what we're they it referred to in translation legitimating causes. By the time the patriarch of Constantinople in the 11th century, for the first time, grants approval to divorce and remarriage in a synodal decree, it's for multiple causes. In right. other words, it hasn't it hasn't come through Matthew 19 through a contested. Um, interpretation, one in which Rome comes out here and the East comes out there. It actually is this amalgamation of Roman civil law and Eastern Orthodox canon law. And eventually they just say what's been going on. They've, yeah. been, they've been practicing divorce and remarriage for, for several hundred years. And now by um, the 1040s, the Pope finally comes out and teaches it, but he's teaching what, what's been going on for some time. I, I said Pope, I meant the Patriarch of Constantinople. Right, right, completely understood. Yeah, I figured that that's who you meant. Uh, one, one final question, and, and then I'd like to pass it on to my brother, Eric. Out, out of curiosity, are you aware of any kind of comments that would be made? And I know we talked about the first few centuries of Christendom. Are you aware of perhaps any comments made in the apostolic fathers on this particular issue. Do they comment upon uh, divorce and remarriage at all? Or is it pretty much really not in their mind? I know we don't have a lot of writings in the apostolic fathers, so it wouldn't surprise me if there really isn't much in there. By apostolic fathers, do you mean? Well, you know, I, you know let, me, let me broaden it. Uh, Anti-Nicene, apostolic or anti-Nicene, before we get to the fourth century. Um. We have, we don't have a developed marital theology in that period, but the texts that we do have, and I, I don't have them off the top of my head, but I have them um, all cataloged in my, my book, are either doing what I said before. They're, they're interpreting Jesus as saying marriage is absolutely indissoluble. Yeah. Or they are leaving open the question of the acceptive clause without committing themselves to the progressive conclusion. So they're leaving it open thinking, let's, let's, you know, yeah. let's see how the Holy Spirit unfolds this for the church because it's unclear to us. Yes, there is some unclarity in the pre-Nicene fathers about how the acceptive clause ought to be read. Thank you very much for that answer, Dr. Brugger. You've been fantastic. I do want to pass it over to my brother, Eric. Now I know he has some great questions for you. Thanks, William. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, Brugger, for coming on. Is my audio coming through? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, you know, and, and uh, I gave a presentation last year on this issue, and uh, one of the things I noticed was that 
uh, there's two things I noticed. I'm going to talk about one and then the other. Uh, the first thing I noticed is that, uh, and it comes out clear in uh, St. Basil the Great's, uh, one of his canonical letters to, uh, Amph uh, I can't remember the name, Amphico uh, Am Amplicophius or Picocius or something like that. Uh, it's 188 in uh, Basil's Epistolary in New Advent. And in that document, uh, he seems to say that if a woman commits adultery on her husband, there's some sort of open door for him to be with another woman after that. But if a man commits adultery on his wife, uh, the woman is bound by the bond, uh, indissoluble, indissolubly. And it, I, I, I've, at the Council of Trula, of course, they bring this up, right? Basil's canon um, in order to justify uh, some sort of, they don't mention that, that, that a man can remarry, but it kind of says if he's, if he does penance, it doesn't really define if, uh, if he can stay with the new woman. Um, but they certainly appeal back to, to Basil the Great. Uh, my interpretation of that small portion of Basil's writing is that it's very unsatisfying and it's not very consistent. Have, have what have you found in your studies uh, on Basil in particular? If you if you can recall off the top of your head, I know uh, that 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 letter is kind of uh, hidden in the uh, epistles of Basil, but uh, it seems like he's a little inconsistent there. The laws for the woman are different than the laws for the male. For the male, yeah, it's his it's canonical epistle to Amphilochius. Um, it, I think it's important to see in his major text on morals, the Moralia, he, in interpreting um, the Matthew 19, says, it's not lawful for a man to dismiss his wife and marry another, nor is it permitted that a man should marry a wife who has been divorced by her husband. Um, the, the council fathers at Trent took that to be Basil's consistent reply. You then get his letter to Amphilochius, and you're right, he does, he who has joined to an adulteress is foolish and impious, yet custom, pre custom prescribes that even adulterous husbands who are living in fornication should be retained by their wives. Wherefore, I do not know whether she who cohabits with a husband dismissed by his wife can be called an adulteress. In these cases, the blame attaches to the woman who has dismissed her husband. Now, as, as you noted, Eric, the texts themselves are, are not transparent. He says, yet custom prescribes. He's not saying divine revelation prescribes. He's not saying sacred scripture prescribes. He's certainly not saying Christ's teaching prescribes. So this is part of the custom. Is he criticizing the custom? Is he underwriting the custom? Is he saying that the custom ought to be taken on board by the Catholics? The text is just not clear, and we'd have to go through an ex exegetical exercise, which would be on the, ex the, the scope of this discussion in order to perhaps come up with a more satisfying conclusion. But what I found interesting is that the fathers of Trent weren't so interest interested in Epistle 188. They were interested in his Moralia. And when Basil comes up, notwithstanding the fact that Orthodox theologians are appealing to the letter to Amphilochius. The council fathers say, no, Basil's with us, you know, and, and they quote him straight out denying divorce and remarriage. So this is one of those early fathers whose texts leave open certain questions as to what they thought. Yes, I, I thank you for that. That, that you know, confirms my observations uh, as a non-expert just reading the texts. And um, it, it, but what I found interesting is that he did he 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 believed that adultery if the wife commits I'm sorry if the husband commits adultery uh, there's some sort of wiggle room as to how he can proceed. But
but if the wife commits adultery, she's bound, which tells me that he didn't think that adultery had an immediate direct, uh, an immediate cause effect between adultery and divorce. Because, you know, some people will read that Methean text or the acceptive clause, and they'll say, well, you know, Christ gives uh, porneia as the exception. But the thing is, if it's an automatic break of the bond, like automatically, then that means that uh, whether the husband or the wife commits adultery, it would be cause, immediate cause and effect that the act of adultery would ontologically break the bond. And so the question is, would they have to get remarried in order to keep that bond? Um, you know, because if the bond is really broken simply by the activity of adultery, then there's no more bond. But the thing is, Basil thinks the bond still endures. Um, so I don't think Basil's really a proof text for at least contemporary Orthodox teaching uh, on the matter. Uh, you know, they because they believe, correct me if I'm wrong, they believe in the dissolubility, right, as a justification for remarriage. Of course, the second and third marriage is a penitential marriage. It's it's uh, uh, the, the the ritual is uh, prepared as a penitential marriage, but they don't think the bond still exists between the the, the former two. Um, so it doesn't seem like Basil and contemporary Orthodox are congruent. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, does, does that sound? Uh, I, I'd agree with you, Eric. Um, yeah. Saint Basil the Great is the chief the principal father for for the east like augustine for 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 western catholics is like the great father well basil the great is the great father for the east and so given these texts that you're talking about they carry for our eastern brothers and sisters a lot more weight than they would for the western if, if augustine had played with with terminology like basil it would have caused more stir in the west and there would have to be a response but augustine is so un unambiguous about absolute indissolubility so yeah i think you're right it's in my reading it wasn't ever clear to me what he meant to assert about the nature of the marriage bond but i, right. I can't say more than that yeah and then the other thing i wanted to bring up was that uh, in my presentation, I went on about the the development of Eastern canon law and how um, the Greeks, it seems like they went from saying, well, if the woman commits adultery, the man can remarry. Okay. Then there was like extra things that started to come in, like with uh, Photius's Nomo canon in the, in the ninth century. And uh, after that, it's like they come up with ways to figure out how the bond can be superseded. And, and it seems to me like where they were in the ninth century and where they got by the 15th, 16th, 17th century, it shows a, a, an increase of conditions to break the bond of, of, of marriage. Um, does that sound correct? Because it seems to me like they're adding conditions. Oh well, if the wife, if the wife attempts to kill the husband, a yeah. poison his poison his food or something like that, um, then he can divorce her and then remarry. Um, you don't find that in the fathers, even in the Greek fathers. No. By the middle of the 15th century, um, Eastern canon law was um, teaching that there were 18 legitimating causes or divorce and remarriage 18 so it had the camel got his nose in with adultery and then he just moved into the tent i think this is an important question though because what it seems to have happened in the east this is now this is my own interpretation but what seems to have happened is the bishops started to permit divorce and remarriage even while there was still an, an incipient and young but clear teaching against it. 
And over time, as it was increasingly tolerated and permitted, they now had to look, how can we justify what we're doing? Um, and the justifications I find to be unsat unsatisfying, Eric, it does seem to me like they're, try they're trying to, you know, they already have a conclusion. They're looking, they're looking now for evidence for that conclusion. But we ourselves right now in the, in the Roman Catholic Church um, are deeply, deeply divided about the question of divorce and remarriage, so much so that even a papal document has implied that um, divorce and remarriage under certain circumstances can be, as it were, blessed by a priest in the inner forum and they can ret return the couple to full communion in the church without repudiating the second, the second union. And what's so dangerous about that is the more that it's, it's tolerated, the more the bishops start to see the need to defend it. If you don't think that's what's going on um, with Walter Casper, then you're just on another planet. He's been living in Germany. Germany has been hemorrhaging marriages. Catholics have, have been divorcing and remarriage for decades. It's been tolerated. And Casper says, look, the genie's not going to get back in the bottle. We've got hundreds of thousands of Catholics who are excluded from Holy Communion. We've allowed this. Let's just admit that there are circumstances under which that this, this can rightly be done. It seems to me history is sort of having another permutation of what happened in the Greek world, which was first the toleration and then the teaching. And it seems to me that those, those cardinals who back divorce and remarriage are ones who simply despair of the possibility that absolute indissolubility can be fruitfully lived in the modern world. Yeah, thank you for that. I agree. I, I think that, uh, you know, Morris Laetitia, um, I remember waking up at four o'clock in the morning to read it when it came out. And I, rem I went right to chapter eight. I, forgive me. I, I'm one of those guys that did that. Um, but I, I remember as I was reading through it, I saw that the Pope um, or his theologian, whoever wrote it, um, he was building the, he was building this case for this exceptional, inculpable scenario. Um, it, so, so as to, you know, kind of get them just under mortal sin, just get them in the venial sin book. And, and then they don't have any barrier to the Eucharist. I thought it was clear what it was going on. Um, but in any case, one of the, the, the objections that the Orthodox give, it's quite common is that okay fine you know we've we've changed drastically on our marriage policy okay but so have you guys because of what's called annulments and they'll know you know the claim is that annulments are basically just uh another way of saying you believe in divorce without saying you believe in divorce um would you would you say that there's any historical precedent for at least the theology of annulment? Um, you know, it, it, even if even if the abuse is, uh, we can all admit that there's an abuse in the annulment um, annulment process. But is there something novel about the theory of annulment? I don't know the history of the teaching on the pastoral outplaying of scenarios where a couple seeks the indult from the church to say your marriage never came into existence. It, it, it certainly was the case that the understanding that when this thing called the vinculum, the bond comes into existence, that that reality, call it, the marriage is an unbreakable reality. And there were certainly understandings that there were times that that didn't come into existence. How do we know that? Well, it one of the big pastoral issues at Trent that was addressed was a thing called clandestine marriages. 
that is, you know, the, you know, the blacksmith's son and the baker's daughter run off. They're gone for a while. They come back and they tell the priest, we exchanged vows. Well, up until the Council of Trent, a clandestine marriage, that is to say a marriage not witnessed by a representative of the clergy, they were taken to be valid marriages. And yet when those marriages would break down, the question would be, were they valid marriages or weren't they valid marriages? So that the understanding that a marriage could be invalid and that this couple could in fact be acting as if they are sacramentally bound, but they're not. That was, that was a clear understanding of the fathers at Trent, which is why they instituted the norms that we still hold today, that in a church before a minister and before two or three witnesses, and that comes straight out of Trent, that could be changed, but when it was instituted, these were instituted as invalidating factors. That is to say, if after today, after we've taught this, if a person marries not in the presence of a priest, not in a church, although we can get dispensation for that, and not in the presence of two or three witnesses, um, a marriage doesn't come into existence. It's a kind of impediment that canon law talks about. That was already understood at the time of the Council of Trent. It's just in the last 60 years where the Western world has increasingly endorsed a kind of no-fault divorce that the numbers of annulment requests have exponentially increased. And is there reason, Eric, for concluding that those not every annulment petition has been treated with the kind of integrity it should have been, such that perhaps a, a ruling of annulled was given when in fact the couple was still married. I think there's reason for concluding it's not always been done responsibly. However, I think in the vast majority of cases, it is done responsibly. And the fact is we're in, a, in an age in which understanding what they're doing or being capable of doing it um, is really not effectively possible for a, lo a large number of people. Yeah, I, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that point about the Council of Trent because the, the church exercising jurisdiction um, and, and putting in place certain impediments uh, would make uh, would make annulments more derivative from that disciplinary ruling. But yeah, oh, okay, I, I'm done. I'm going to pass this back to uh, Michael. I think we have an audience watching, um, and so they, they may have some questions, Michael. Yes, this one is from Rob Grimes. Um, where can we get or learn more about your work? About my work? Yeah. Um, well, you can you can Google my name, E. Christian Brueger. Um, I have a, a column with the National Catholic Register called Difficult Moral Questions, where people send in questions that are difficult, not, you know, may I have an abortion, but a difficult question, and I try to vet it with them, um, and then we publish that. Um, I, I live in Front Royal, Virginia. I mean, there's, if you're looking, contact me. If you, My email is ecbruger7 at gmail.com. I'd be happy to oh, send you're, you my you're, CD. You're nearby my alma mater. <laughs> Christendom? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. Great time. Great time. Um, Another one, follow-up. Can you ask about the letter to St. Boniface by Gregory II on letting a man marry again in case of a woman's health? I could be misinterpreting this. Uh, any comments there on that one? Rob, it's a, it's a question that I don't have um, on the tip of my mind, so I'd, I'd have to look back and, and, and see the text. Apologize. Um, are there any other sources that corroborate St. Augustine's understanding of the term pornea? That corroborate Augustine's understanding of the term? Right. Well, so many fathers who followed Augustine um, followed his reading 
of the term pornés, his interpretation of fornicaciones. Um, the sixth, fifth and sixth century fathers, um, the council fathers, Aquinas, you know, they they all will take Augustine's reading of Matthew 19 as as authoritative, including his interpretation of the term porneia. But I don't have a list of specific texts for you to go to. No, no problem. Uh, I'm trying to see. I, I know that there were some more, but scanning through, here we go. Um, do, do you think that in the past 30 years, annulments have been given uh, more liberally? I do. I do think they have. I did my PhD at Oxford, and I went one day to the Jesuit house there, and a, uh, an elderly Jesuit canonist had just returned from 20 years in Rome, serving multiple sessions on the Roman rota. The rota is the highest tribunal, uh, marriage tribunal in the Catholic Church. And um, I uh, was talking to him about marriage and divorce and remarriage. And he said, in all of my years as a canonist, there was never an annulment request that I denied. And I said, that's implausible, Father. No, I said, what if, what if the couple really was married? I mean, you've looked at thousands of requests, and he got quite angry at me and said, it's not my place to exclude people from access to the sacrament for the rest of their lives. I said, well, that's not the issue. The, the issue at stake is the integrity of the marriage bond. The anecdote is simply to say that if members of the Roman Rota believed you could hand out annulments um, liberally to anyone who asks for it, then I expect that there are people in local tribunals who think that. But I have met many canonists who are quite conscientious on the question, and I, I think it would be an error for us to conclude that the majority of marriage, tribunal, marriage tribunals are anything other than conscientious. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Excellent. Um, you know, Dr. Brugger, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. This has been extremely helpful and enlightening. You're welcome on the show anytime. I appreciate that, Michael. Eric, William, did you all have any parting words? No, just many thanks uh, to Dr. Brugger. And uh, maybe we could uh, do this again with a much more finer subject matter in the future. Sure. Be happy just to. Just one comment, uh, Dr. Brugger, and I, I don't want to uh, yes. hold us all here much longer. And uh, to the point, I saw somebody in the audience uh, were wondering about Oration 38 from from uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, and I've looked at that in depth, and I wanted to, um, to just, uh, I think the person, maybe, I don't know what it was that they were wondering, they were wondering if uh, Gregory was allowing for divorce and remarriage, and just wanted to point out that Oration... I think it was 37 or 38. Um, when I read it, and I'm pretty sure you've looked at it before, and I have it open in front of me, it says, now the law, talking about, of course, the, the old law, grants divorce for every cause, but Christ, not for every cause. And it says, but he allows only separation from uh, from the, the female that has committed a, a fornication, only separation, and in all other things, he commands patience. When I read that, I don't find anything in there, and I'm looking at the whole thing that allows for divorce and remarriage. But I just wanted to make that brief comment for the person that was asking. Uh, I don't know if you read the exact same thing there that I'm reading. William, that, that is just one example of the texts that could lead one to believe that the father sure. writing is uncertain about absolute indissolubility, yeah. but he does not go out go forward and assert clearly that the dissolution of the bond takes place such that it would be licit for the yeah. divorced man to remarry. Um, that's a classic example. Um, yes, I think in the minds of many of the church fathers, it was still an open question as to whether a consummated Christian marriage is absolutely, under all instances, mm -hmm. indissoluble. But by the time of Trent, what we have is 
a widespread pastoral permissi permissibility of separation. Bed, not bond, was the term that was used over and over again by the father. It's licit to separate if it would be dangerous for the spouses to be together or there's irksome cohabitation in which they, they can't peaceably live together. But the bond still, the still remains um, in, in place, in integrity. And uh, that's what becomes clear to the, to the Catholics. Although in these early texts, there is some ambiguity, I agree. Thank you, for, thank you very much for that, Dr. Bruger. And uh, to comment further, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. Look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you, William. I hope we have a chance to do that. Everybody, thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit the bell for notification of upcoming shows. Also, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us and get access to extra content. Till next time, God bless. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now.